guys. How's it going? Uh, this is Austin here. We got another wonderful episode of the Third Impact Anime Podcast coming for you guys this evening. And uh, I've got my brother Andrew with me. How's it going, Andrew? Hey, Austin. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. Doing pretty well. And um, our other excellent co-hosts, we've got Ryan with us for just a little bit. Yup. And we've got Tobias here. A pleasure as always. How are you doing, Ryan? I am very tired, and I woke up with a 102 fever this morning, so I am, like, pretty much, like, 30% here at the moment. Man, dude, well, I appreciate all 30 of that 30% that made it here. I really all do. All 30%, <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah, I'm sorry you feel so cruddy. Yeah, me too. I hope I didn't get Marissa sick. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. How are you doing, Tobias? Well, uh, I'm not quite that bad, but I'm working on about half the amount of sleep I usually am, so, uh, yeah, a little exhausted. Yeah, we we apologize if this podcast is a little loosey goosey. It's a little bit late. Uh, we just got out of a production meeting with the whole team, talking about some, you know, upcoming stuff and about you know the uh, perpetual climb that is the hill of getting organized. So, um, but um, I think we're doing pretty well, and I'm pretty pretty pleased with uh, with everybody's work so far. Um, but basically, this episode um, we're going to be talking mainly about our first impressions of the winter 2018 season. Uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, coverage of various shows on our website that you can find at thirdimpactanime.wordpress.com. And we share all of those things on Facebook as well, which is facebook.com slash thirdimpactanime, uh, where you can see our seasonal coverage. Uh, we're not doing every show this season because like, that's super impossible because we're not Anime News Network and we're just not paid for this at all so <laughs> but um we're doing a lot we're doing some shows that really uh we personally are interested in and stuff like that and um we're excited to talk about those today um so we're just going to go through the uh, my anime list chart and sort of go in order as how they have it set up but uh first uh we got a we got a question from uh from our twitter solicitations um to tobias so tobias if you want to read out that twitter question i guess we can talk about that first yeah, so just to quickly cover there, uh, this weekend I was at Comic-Con in Birmingham, Alabama, and I believe, Ryan, you and Marissa were at a, another local event here in North Carolina, is that correct? Yeah, it was uh, Charlotte Mini-Con, which is basically a like half-day version of Heroes Con, which is in the summer. And we're going to do a whole episode on that here later, but uh, this question did come from one of my new follows from Comic-Con here, a uh, Catherine Montgomery on Twitter. And Catherine asks, uh, how do you prepare for your panels at the convention? Or in other words, uh, what kind of work and research goes into creating a panel? I, I kind of feel like, you know, she directed this question toward me, but I feel like Austin, you know, especially, and even Ryan, since she's done a couple here, maybe we could sort of like, you know, answer this collectively. Sure. It was your question. So you go first. Yeah. So uh, let's see here. I think. Like in general, the way we I start with these is I go with an idea that I've had for a long time anyway, a long time interest of mine that I've already kind of thought too much about being a, you know, a nerd as I am. So I already have this amassed amount of, of knowledge and, you know, pseudo expertise, you know, to, really to begin with. And it's just a matter of deciding to turn that into an idea, into a panel and filtering it through, you know, that you need the fact that you have an hour long time slot, the fact that you have you know, a PowerPoint to do or a screen to use and audio visual elements to use while communicating this information in that time slot, just finding a way to convert that amassed knowledge that I have into something that's, that's useful, that would work in that format. Uh, as far as research goes, uh, it's a little bit different than other sort of research projects, I feel like, and I kind of mentioned this in my art of paneling panel, and that you know, with anime and fandom, you don't really have the written, the amount of written work that you would have in other research subjects. You don't have the body of literature that's, that's there already. So in a lot of ways, you have to sort of resort to social media or other third party sources that the general academia would tell you to avoid. But I find really useful in terms of like anime study and fandom study, because a lot of the voices that are very important that have already studied this before are still alive. And they're still very active online. So it's very easy to go talk to those those primary sources directly to get this information. So with that, it's just really a matter of like taking that initial idea, that initial love of whatever aspect of fandom, crystallizing it into a 
you know, a format that would work, a panel. And then from there, just honing that ability and practicing it. Uh, you know, every single, every single one of my panels, I haven't done just once. It's been done again and again and again over and over. And I keep going to these commissions and I just get better at it overall. That sounds about right. Yeah. Cool. For me, for me, um, I do pretty much the same thing. Like I have an idea in my head. I have a groundwork, but I don't actually start actually putting the panel together until I've done research or like thought it to death that I pretty much know exactly what I want to say. And also, uh, specifically with my anime that saved anime panel, I'm talking about a very controversial topic. So I wanted to do like enough research to actually be like, hey, I'm pretty well thought out on this topic. I'm I'm a good person to listen to on this. And I did enough research that I could pretty much anticipate any of the well actuallys in my audience. Right. Yeah. You, you, you did quite a lot and you had the graphs to prove it too. Yeah, those were a pain in the neck to find because yeah. there are not very many sites that track the metrics of Crunchyroll back to 2006. <laughs> wow. Good point. Well, on my end, I just take a whole bunch of like anime Blu-rays and just like keep throwing them at my computer with PowerPoint <laughs> open and then eventually like a panel just sort of appears. You know, I, I like to consider myself like an alchemist. Like I've never been trained, <laughs> but that's basically how all of my panels have happened. You ever had a panel that turns out to be like a girl and a dog? Um, only once, but I, I never actually performed that panel. No, this is spoiler territory. That's <laughs> bias. Yeah, right. But oh, um, it's a ten-year-old show. Get over it. No, yeah, it's it's really old. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, serious. Um, more seriously, I guess. Um, I mean, it's it's all sort of the same kind of process. But um, I guess with me, like the way that I make my panels is that I don't I don't sort of. I don't do all of my research ahead of time. I build the panel as I research um, to see, and it, it kind of is a it's a very helpful boost to see, like you know, sort of the the um, the down and dirty work of like doing the research and going through the shows and going through the um, the written works and interviews and videos and stuff like that. That can be a lot to take in, like all at once. So what I try and do is I I try and build do the building blocks of my panel like you know one at a time and sort of get them to a completed phase and then move on to the next subject like for example with my watanabe panel that i just did like i would tackle like i tackled uh watanabe's like early stuff first and like did all the research for that and then put it all together in the panel and then i moved on to do like specifically cowboy bebop uh research and put all that together and then moved on to Shampoo and Space Dandy and so on. Um, because it's really helpful for, for me and just the way that I work to be able to visualize it as I go along. Um, and because I'm, I'm able to sort of, you know, witness that, that progress, you know, unfolding in front of me. And, and that, can be, that can be really helpful if you feel like too overwhelmed or like discouraged by the amount of work that you have to do. If you like, you know, build your house like from the base up and like make sure to, you know, finish it as you go. And that's exactly. that's how I work, at least. So um, for some people, that might be helpful. For some people, they like to just get it all out there and then sort of add details in later. But I do details as I go, so. And I will say to kind of like tie that off there, yeah, we have a lot of a lot of people really interested in doing what we do and seeing like all this amount of work and all that that huge effect that we that we present. But it's really not too difficult to really get into it, especially at things like Comic Con, where they accepted every single one of my submissions, where you've got, you know, other events that do that. You know, if you're looking to get into the game, it is incredibly easy to do so. Mm -hmm. Most everyone already has the resources. Everyone's, for the most part, has a laptop if you're a student. You know, I mentioned that in Art of Paneling. It's really easy to do. If you have a particular subject you really want to talk about that's fandom related, please, please present that panel. We really need other great panels right now. Right. And I mean, it doesn't have to be like the most original, most like groundbreaking topic ever. You just got to, you know, put something up there that's like well organized, well curated, and then just talk about like how interesting and passionate you are, how interesting the thing is and like how passionate you are about about, um, you know, doing it. Yeah. The only thing about getting into it, though, is it's easy to get into. But if you become known as like that guy, nobody will come to your panels and they'll stop accepting you. So do the work. 
clarify yeah. what you mean by that guy. I, I probably agree with you, but what do you mean? Like that guy who does like half thought out panels that basically does nothing but just makes like crappy jokes the whole time that nobody actually like enjoys. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and like in, in sort of in that vein too, like, like know your audience and, and sort of play to sort play to the most like general denominator. Like I know a lot of fandoms have like certain inside jokes and things like that. And those are fun to like reference, but make Make sure that you don't like alienate any like broad audience that might just be interested in your thing and not necessarily know like all of that like very specific like in stuff. Right. Cool. Does anybody else have anything to add to that? Nope. I think we're good. Yeah. Cool. Good question, uh, Twitter person. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Again, uh, Catherine from Comic Con this past. All right, well, Catherine, we uh, really appreciate your question submission, and uh, we'd be happy to answer any of your questions anytime on the Third Impact Anime Podcast. That goes for anybody. Yes, indeed, for sure. Yeah, just uh, tweet at us and ask us any any question that you would like. Our Twitter is at T-I underscore anime for anybody who wants to know. You all want to know. Yeah, that actually, let me clarify real quick. That goes for everybody except for you, Michael. That's fair. Michael? You know what you did. He does know what he did. Oh gosh, what what was that th- Tobias in your panel like the the Dragon Con joke? <laughs> it's it's Miami Mike. Miami Mike. Yes. <laughs> Miami Mike. <laughs> Miami Mike yeah, I know what you did to me at Dragon Con. <laughs> yeah. Everybody oh, except for Miami Mike and Edwin. Edwin's not allowed to ask us any questions. That's true. We Edwin's need to have, we need to get him on the podcast. Like honest yeah. to god. I've been be trying fine, to get though. I've been trying to get him on two guys in video games, but his schedule is like all sorts of all over the place, and mine is even more sorts of all over the place. <laughs> he made me eat a banana with a skin on it. Oh God! Yeah, but you did it for you did it for extra life. I did, so. it, for ch- I did it for the kids. Yeah, yeah, you did it uh, for charity. So shout out to Edwin, but negative shout out to Edwin as right, well. Yeah. So I guess we'll go ahead and jump into our topic for the day, talking about winter 2018. Um, this is uh, an interesting season. It's got a lot of neat stuff and a lot of a lot of samey stuff too, I guess. But I guess that's really any season. But um, there's some pretty interesting stuff that uh, at least I've been watching and that I, uh, even if I haven't started it yet, I'm pretty interested in checking out. So I guess um, according to the going off of the My Anime List uh, seasonal chart, I guess we'll start off with the one that none of us have seen, which is Violet Evergarden, because no one in the U.S. can watch it yet, because it is a Netflix exclusive that has not dropped yet. But, excuse me, I've seen a lot of gifts for it already, because it's available on Netflix and other countries, and it, it looks really, really awesome. I'm really excited to check it out. It's another super beautiful KyoAni show that I am looking forward to watching in like six months whenever we get it. So, um, anything else about Violet Evergarden that you guys have observed? Uh, no, I haven't really seen too, too much about it, but I definitely want to check that one out. Yeah, yeah. me too. Yeah, KyoAni is definitely really, really, really doing some some beautiful work in the past couple of years. I mean, their stuff has always been like, pretty exceptional compared to sort of the um the average seasonal you know stuff that comes out and it it really stands out and they're carving a niche out for them or they they've always carved their own little niche out for themselves among sort of the large swaths of like school anime and stuff like that because they're you know more willing to take risks and do do some more unique things but we have also got another season of Overlord that I think Bill is checking out, and he's going to be doing some uh, seasonal reviews of that um, coming up pretty soon, I hope. Um, I think he's going to do like the first three episodes all in one sort of batch review for the site, so I'm excited to check that out. Um, Overlord, I, I may have seen the first episode of the first season, and um, I thought it was interesting. I just never kept up with it, so... Maybe Bill's reviews will inspire me to um, to get on that. But uh, first up, I guess, Ryan, you can talk about this one, is the second season of Seven Deadly Sins. So what do you think of it? I think it's pretty good so far. And uh, just disclaimer on this one, this one is also not available in the States yet. And so to abide by our policy of supporting the official release, I've been flying to Japan every week to watch this. Oh, yeah. That wow. is, that's a thing that I like to do. Um, 
And yeah, it's pretty good. The first episode was really slow and it suffered from like second season pickup where it knows it's been a while. So it, it reintroduces you to everybody again. It rehashes the plot and then you don't really get very much except for like a couple jokes and then the plot progression at the very tail end of the episode. But since then, it's been pretty good. Like the plot is definitely going to be like intense this time. I think like it got a little dark at some points last season, but this season I think is going to be even worse and I'm pretty excited for it. And so, um, yeah, but uh, what were you going to ask? I was going to ask, um, is it like a continuation of the first season or is this like the beginning of a new arc or like where, where it's are a new we? Arc. It's okay. an entirely new arc. The end of the first season resolved what was happening. There was an evil plot to revive the demon clan and they thwarted that. And then it turns out they didn't thwart that. And that's the plot of the second season. <laughs> oh, neat. Okay. So are you excited for it or does it feel like um, you wish the show would go in a different direction or like what are what are your impressions of like where it's where it's going from what you know now? It's definitely going in a direction I didn't expect. Like each of the characters is going through a pretty individual arc or like paired up with other characters to go through an arc, which is interesting. It's just happening a little too fast, I think. Mm, I see. And like, the, OK, go ahead. It's called the Seven Deadly Sins, and the Seven Deadly Sins are like a group of knights from this alternate version of medieval England, or Britannia, I'm sorry. And um, Long live Lelouch v. Britannia. Right, that's that's my thought. Like, every time I hear them say Britannia, I'm just like, no, this is not Britannia, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so they introduced you to each sin individually, uh, in the first season and their arcs were pretty contained but this time they're all going off doing things and it's been three episodes and I already have way too many things to follow oh wow like, there's like five or six different arcs going on right now there's like the Holy Knights there's Meliodas there's Deanne and yeah it's it's a big old mess Ooh. But I hope it starts to slow down a little bit some of these arcs may not be lasting as long as I think and they have the overarching villains to fight as well, so they'll probably reunite fairly soon. Mm -hmm. But the first two episodes went way too fast for me, and I was just like, eh, you're going to about here. I need you down to like a two maybe because you're going like way too fast. And that's interesting because it's slated for 24 episodes. You'd think they wouldn't rush through it so quickly unless they're trying to. Um... Unless they have a lot to get through. Yeah, that's that's the thing. Like, if they've got a whole bunch of content that they want to cover in this season, because otherwise, you know, I don't think they'd be moving so quickly. So I, I guess we'll just see, and I'm sure you'll keep us updated on that through your reviews. Yeah, weekly reviews. Uh, one will be coming out tomorrow or the day after, hopefully, after I get back from Japan, because that's definitely a thing I'm doing. Um, oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Bring us all back uh, souvenirs, yeah. yeah. On that topic also, I'll be watching uh, Fate Extra when I uh, go to Japan because mm -hmm. um that started airing yesterday and yeah i am a huge fate fan i played fate extra on the psp and loved it it is probably the best fate game like every fan agrees on that so i'm interested to see how the anime turns out and what changes they decide to make or what arc they even go with cool cool all right, well, I guess moving right along, um, the next show we've got on the list is Citrus, which none of us have watched, even though I do enjoy a good orange every now and again. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess I'm just going to skip over that one because I haven't really, uh, I don't really know much about it other than sort of the the surface level stuff that I've seen through uh, social media, I guess. If, if anybody else has any any takes that they got on on Citrus, I guess we'll just move right along. I've seen that it's basically like a Yuri anime, and a lot of people are losing their minds over that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know much about that, but I also have to drop off because I'm about to pass out due to illness. Yep. Oh, that's true. So yeah, that's all we got Ryan for. So uh, sure thanks for I... giving your uh, your two cents on Seven Deadly. And have fun. I'll give you about like seven cents more. So yeah, I'll bring you back a souvenir this time. Please I promise. Do. Thank you. <laughs> you, should yep. go eat, will... you should go eat some citrus. Yeah, yeah. I'll eat some citrus. That's what yeah, I'm man. Do. That'd perk you right up. Yeah, citrus and citrus. I feel like that's like the perfect medicine. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. All right. Good night, dude. Night.
All right, Tobias. So next up is Darling in the Franks. We're starting off serious. Yeah, um, I, I'm not caught up on this. So I can't quite say. I only watched up until this point the first episode. And now I think the third one just came out this past weekend. Mm-hmm. Uh, going on the first, step of, uh, first episode alone, I really enjoyed it. Uh, in general, I feel like we've got a big mix of a lot of different uh, Gynax and Trigger stuff. We have like the architecture and world design that very reminiscent of Evangelion, the plug suit. Yeah, so we have uh, you know Shigeto Koyama working on the mechanical designs there. He previously worked on uh, Die Buster, 2004, Star Driver in what 2011, 2012, I think. And it really shows with us with the Sterlitzia's design, for instance, it's very reminiscent of some of the stuff from Die Buster, and of course the uh, Talburn from Star Driver. Uh, the, one of the major themes in Darling of the Franks is very much this like teenage sexuality. We do see this society that's very mechanical, very sterilized. We we get a glimpse in the first episode where none of the kids really get like understand sex at all, and I feel like that's kind of a setup with the introduction of our uh, our main characters Zero Two and Hero, and her being more feral and animalistic. Uh, I mentioned that because episode two, the big deal that I think got everyone really, you know, up in a hizzy is the cockpit design where the cockpit, you know, you have this male and female pairing in the cockpit with, you know, the female kind of bent over and what you would, you know, call a doggy style configuration. And that's kind of got people up in arms that is obviously, you know, uh, objective, uh, sexually objectifying, uh, you know, cockpit design, which I can get. But on the other hand, I have to wonder if these people have seen Kill a Kill. <laughs> Trigger isn't known for their subtlety. And while maybe the show, you know, with A1 Productions co-producing this, like maybe they could have been a little more, I don't know, normal, not turn the dial up to 11. Mm-hmm. This is still the same studio that made Kill a Kill. And if you've seen that, like they are all about that crazy over the top stuff. So I don't, I don't, again, I haven't seen the episode, so maybe there's more to it than that. But it, all I've heard people complain about is the whole dark, you know, doggy style in the Franks, and maybe in action it looks more skeevy. But just from the clip that I've seen, I, again, kill a kill. Like, I don't see it being all that bad just on that. But again, who knows? I feel like the theme of you know teenage sexuality could be, you know, very easily uh, overdone, easily jump the shark, as it were. So it's going to be one of those really, uh, one of those fine lines they have to walk if they're going to make the show work as a whole. So I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to keep watching it for sure because it's still a trigger show and I really like the, their output. So I can see it kind of going overboard and even becoming dull uh, in the same way Kids Niver could be. But uh, we'll see. Yeah, you kind of nailed some of my general thoughts about it too. Like, um, like I'm I'm definitely interested in, in, in what kind of you know, messaging they are going for and what they could go for um, with that whole, you know, exploration of this, of these kids that are sort of so, so sheltered and so like, you know, not allowed to sort of live their best life. You know, they sort of are in like this robot military academy to, you know, be part of this thing that none of them really seem to really kind of have a grasp on why they're made to do this. It's, it's sort of ambiguous and they're sort of, you know, sort of under the thumb of this, you know, this adult world that is making them do these things for reasons they may not be privy to. And, and sort of how that's like stunting their, you know, physical and emotional growth and things like that. Cause there definitely seems to be that, that element of, uh, connection and like, it's definitely very obvious with the with the sexuality too, but like also like interpersonal connections too, just between people. And um, there, I know you said you've only you know watched the first episode. Um, I watched the second episode, and it definitely explores a little bit more of of that like emotional the emotional consequences of like physical uh, activity, I guess. And they they right. talk about that a little bit, um, and sort of how how the um, how the feelings of what it's like to pilot these robots in sort of this very, very strange way, this very like uncomfortable way, especially for these, for these young girls and like seeing how that affects them and how it also affects the guys too. And um, I just hope that they, you know, really 
go for that and make it something really genuine and really, really, um, you know, poignant and not just right. fan service. Well, I have to ask at that point, like, I, I didn't really think of that. Cause I, again, I haven't seen the episode yet, but I, you, I do think it's a really good point and to bring that up now, the, you know, the feelings of, of this, uh, you know, uh, of this physicality that they're not used to this awkward teenage, you know, fumblings in the dark kind of deal, but with giant robots. So do you think from what you've seen, do you think they handled it okay? Or was it a little, a little more on the skeevy side? From your personal I mean, in, in the moment it felt skeevy and it felt like objectifying, but then they followed it up. Um, and I'm not quite convinced that they have done it in a meaningful way yet, but I think it's something that, if that's going to be something that we continue to see in this show and by by what I've seen so far, I think that that's something that we will continue to see because that seems like a, such a big part of it. I just hope that sort of this one small step that I've seen already that wasn't that was sort of a half measure becomes a full measure later on. And I know it's it's really early because this is I, I mean, I've only seen two episodes out of 24 and uh, it's really hard to say yet. Um, and I, I keep telling myself that this is Studio Trigger. It's, it's, you know, a group of creators that, you know, I enjoy. And I think that they have really interesting things to say. And um, I felt very similar about Kill a Kill whenever I first started watching it, you know, way back in, in 2014, whenever it was first coming out week to week. And, you know, I honestly didn't keep up with it because it, it kind of turned me off. I, I thought that this was, it was a little bit too, you know, not what I not the sort of thing that I wanted to watch. And then, you know, eventually I returned to it and it ended up being something really, really cool that had a lot of interesting things to say and a lot of interesting, you know, pieces of history that it was pulling from and a lot of different, you know, anime and cinematic themes and all this stuff. So, you know, I'm I'm going to keep putting my faith in Trigger until they, like, definitively let me down. But I, I, I want to say that, 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 that that's not going to happen. Okay, cool. So I'm 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 on the wait and see train. Sounds like a play day for a Freudian. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. There's there's some of that in there for sure, and a lot of it is very like overt. Like it's not even subtle at all. Kind of like what you were saying earlier, Tobias. Yeah, and there's a whole metaphor with the, with the flower. There's like you know flower terminology they use that. Yep. Oh straight yeah. Up. <laughs> straight up. Straight up for sure. And that cockpit. Yep. It's just right there, right there. But um, I guess moving on, we'll, we'll skip over that one. Uh, you said you started watching uh, Takagi-san, right? Yeah, I watched an episode uh, like the night after Ichiban Khan. Uh, and I, I really want to watch more. I really enjoyed it. Uh, in general, it's this just really cute show about these two school-age kids. Uh, our main character, uh, Nishikata, the boy, and uh, you know, Takagi-san, the little girl. And they just tease and make fun of each other the whole time, and it's <laughs> it's just cute. Like he he's he's the really like up, strung up like flustered one. He's trying to get one up. Like he like she always she always gets them, and he really wants to like you know make her blush, like embarrass her, like get her, you know get her in the gag. But she always plays it really cool and really smooth, and she she like, she never gets got as it were. <laughs> and like at least in the first episode, it kind of implies that maybe she's got feelings for him. She kind of likes him, but. She, I guess she expresses that through the teasing. And I don't know. It's really wholesome and really cute. I really enjoyed it. Uh, again, if you want to see something really wholesome, but a little snarky and fun with the, the way these two characters play play off each other, uh, I would definitely recommend checking that out. So it's not gross? Oh, no, not at all. No, it is it's very, very much a wholesome show. And it's just fun. It's like, it, it feels weird in that regard. Like, it because it, it, you see these two characters that can play off each other, like, especially with, with her. Like in any other show, that tone would go along with something more snarky. I feel like, mm-hmm. like maybe with the next thing we're gonna talk about, but it it doesn't go that way at all. It is completely wholesome. It's just fun to see like the way she gets him, the way that uh, she's able to rope in like the teacher to like get him in these gags and like catch him in these these little tricks. And it's just kind of a really cute wholesome. Hmm. It kind of uh, the way you described it, it sounded a little sounded a little bit kind of like um, <clears throat> excuse me. Of um oh gosh what's that show called um I'm trying to think of it uh have I seen it no um oh man it's it's the show where the it's it's the two kids in class and like the the boy is always trying is always doing some sort of weird thing and the girl is always like freaked out by it's it it's like the art of wasting time or something yes like that. yes um 
Yeah, that show. Um, it it kind of sounds like that, where the girl is like, like the boy is always doing these like really stupid, ridiculous things in class, and it makes the girl like so upset. She's just like, "How can you possibly be doing these things in class? Like, how how is the teacher not noticing this and all this stuff?" And she gets so flustered and so annoyed, and basically it just follows her like reactions to it. And then she does like one wrong little thing in class, and the teacher's like, "Hey, be yeah. quiet." Yeah, that, that's exactly the tone of what they're doing over here. Oh, exactly. excellent. Yeah, it, excellent. it's great. I, I would definitely recommend it. It's not, I don't think it'll be on anyone's like top one of the mm -hmm. season. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of other really standout shows, but it's a really great show. If you want something that's not really goofy or even like, you know, perverted or even like like dark humor or you know, more adult humor, like it's just it's pure. It's a lot of fun and really like I really like the way these two characters play off each other. Cool, cool. The Master of Killing Time. That's what I was thinking of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Master of Killing Time. All right, so to move to the opposite end of the spectrum, we've got <laughs> Pop Team Epic. So, yes. uh, Tobias, I know you have a lot of thoughts about Pop Team, so I guess I'll let you continue. Oh, man. There's really nothing more I could say about Pop Team Epic that, I mean, you just kind of have to watch this show. Uh, it, it's either going to like do it for you and be like the best thing you've ever seen, the best comedy this season, like it is for me, or you're just not going to get it. And it's just going to go over you, not necessarily go over your head, because that implies, you know, like you're not getting it. But like, it's just not funny to you. And it's a very weird, like modern style of anti comedy, like where you take these expectations and just like, you just can, you just negate them. A lot of people call this professional shit posting. And that's a really quick, like quick and easy description. Like, I don't feel it really does it justice because there's not really any shit posting. Like, this show knows what it's doing and it does it well. It's just a very different style of humor than what most people are used to. And the first episode is very reference heavy. Uh, they kind of go through a bunch of stuff from this, like, people that I, I don't know, like, would be watching anime and watching this kind of stuff would know. So, like, it leads off for, with this this opening that's like this, this typical rom com school show, uh, Hoshiro Girl Drop. And it's like this little <laughs> opening situation. Where it's like this guy, his parents are about to go on an extended vacation, but they're this girl that he's got to like hang out with or whatever. It doesn't really tell you much before it jumps into this really banging, awesome like opening, this modern style anime opening that's fully done. Like the music's awesome, it's great. And at the end of it, right before we get to the actual episode, like one of the main characters from Pop Team Epic, Popko, just rips the screen open and is like, nope, that's not the show we're getting. You're, <laughs> you're getting this actual show. It, it, this is a really great way and only like only this could do this but like the actual show itself it opens up with this really great uh like your name uh callback yeah like yep. this kind of like it, it just comes out of nowhere and again if you're an anime fan in, in 2018 you you if you haven't seen known or your name like you're at least really aware of it For and, sure. if you've se and you've seen your name like we all can agree your name's a really great movie i think mm -hmm. but like that that whole radwimps opening really was Honestly, I don't I think it really was not great in the movie. <laughs> it stood out like a sore thumb when I watched it. I was like, man, this is the most anime thing, like to have a little opening animation in a movie. And I didn't really like it when I saw it. It was interesting, but it really stood out. And to see Pop Team Epic just like to to to, to like call that out it was I thought was really great. And to follow it up with a Chrono Trigger reference, like, oh, that's that's I haven't seen that in a long time. I didn't think anime would care about that anymore. But then I think, you, I think you, I think you tweeted about like how ridiculous this show like plays to your personal tastes. Yeah, that was, <laughs> and like the next thing, like you go, we go into a string of references where they mention of all things Skyrim. Yeah, and yeah, you know, I think like I think that's important. Like Skyrim is one of those things that most people have opinions on now, but there, like Skyrim is a very important game in the 2010. Like when we look back in the 2010, Skyrim will be on a list of most influential games, whether whatever your opinions of Todd Howard and all that crap are now. And for this Western game, you know, very important over here, you know, in our console stuff, for a Japanese anime to reference this very slightly like that, I thought was pretty amazing. There's little things like that that you don't really see in a lot of this, even this referential comedy. The Your Name gag, okay, well, everyone knows your name, but to see Chrono Trigger? And then Skyrim, and then Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, <laughs> really? Yeah. Like this show knows what it's doing because all those things are would be important to a nerd in this year. Yeah, like Guardians of the Galaxy. Even if you're not a Marvel fan, like I still think that scene they play in Guardians of the Galaxy, 
the, the whole parody of that plays off like a very important part of that movie culture. And they, they, they cap it all off with a fidget spinner of all things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it definitely just, seems like a, a product of like worldwide pop culture, just like poking yeah. fun at, at, at everything. Whereas a lot of like anime comedies that you see are very much like these are jokes about otaku and jokes about anime stuff. But to see like the fidget spinner joke and like the Skyrim stuff, it's, it's definitely interesting to see that stuff pop up into anime because you don't really see much of that unless you're watching, you know, Daikon 4, but yeah. that's like 30 years old. It's like yeah. a Thug Life compilation is what it yeah. is. That's what it reminds me of because <laughs> yeah. it's so like... Huh? What? It just they just did that? Mm -hmm. No. Like, it's also yeah. a little robot chicken in the in a way yeah, with mm -hmm. it with its structure at least. You're right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it can be, yeah. But I feel like like the, the original thing is just this uh, just traditional four panel comic, which every most every slice of life like anime is based on a four panel comic, so that's nothing new. But a lot of those turn these skits into these this longer thing. When we think of like a four panel comic, very four panel like four panels you read really quickly. Pop Team Epic keeps that same amount of time through every skit. So you're quickly breezing through these things like there's no tomorrow. Only with some of the new original stuff do they really take their time. But in, in ep episode three, when they do the whole red car skit, uh, that's exactly how it is in the manga. It's just four panels where I'm talking about buying a red car so they can kill people easier. <laughs> <laughs> and it works because it's like Naruto Wakamoto. Uh, this is uh, awesome. This is like hot, deep male voice. It's like talking about killing people, you know, well, this cute girl buying a car. It, it just, it, it's absurd. It's weird. Like it, it just, like it juxtaposes the male voices with the, with the female cast and does so in a really intelligent way. There's, you know, a bunch of references like in episode one In episode two, we have the whole animation skit from the very beginning where there's like a rough animation outline and then the girls pop up and they make them do some gags and there's the voice actors in there. And this just like, we're assaulted by, one gag turns into another gag, turns into another gag, which turns into like Sadako hiding under the chairs. Like you don't know where this thing is going to end until it does. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And it, again, maybe not everyone's cup of tea and I get that. I get that. But I think the show is, is a lot smarter than, than the, you know, the whole professional shit posting opinion really, really gives it. And I feel like, like in the long term. We're going to see this this coming up as being a very important work, I think. Yeah, me too. Um, I just guess uh, some of my personal issues with it is like, I, I still, I wish that it were shorts. I really do. Um, like a more curated collection of like their best gags. And I know that the humor is, is highly suggestive, uh, suggestive, subjective. Um, and sort of what you outlined already that this is not going to be like everyone's cup of tea. Um, and a lot of like a lot of the jokes land for me, but a lot of them don't. And I guess that's just my humor style. But um, I feel like if it was like a more sort of uh, curated series of shorts, maybe they could sort of cut out the chaff and not have to like fill this episode with with like those really extended like repetition scenes where they switch the voice actors. Like I wish they would do that like between episodes, maybe not during the same episode, but I guess, I don't know. They've, they've, they've chosen to do it this way, probably to set up some larger extended joke that plays out later in the series. I guarantee, uh, cause that's it's awesome. just the kind of show that's going to do that. Like I just have that feeling. Um, but I mean, if, if I had like any major complaints about that, it would be, it would be like that. So Awesome. I think like the main thing with the voice actors is that they're, they're really important every every week. They're very different and they're no notable people. Like yeah. The first the first episode, uh, the male voices were the people that the characters said in the manga that they wanted to voice them. I thought it was a really cool callback. And in the last episode I saw in three, it was uh, Norio Wakamoto and uh, uh, Ryusei Nakao who voiced both Cell and Frieza in Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also very notable voices. Uh, I thought having those combinations there, and you know, I haven't really checked the the, next, the, the, the most recent one yet, but uh, I think if, if they can keep those really interesting combinations that keep people checking the credits and things like that, will really, uh, I think that'll really kind of make it pay off. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, uh... I just uh, I hope that <laughs> they get the guy who like is in everything. The guy that plays Dio in JoJo. I hope <laughs> that they get him to play both girls. Oh man! <laughs> Somebody was saying of, like 
uh, saying how they, you know, they're, you know, uh, starting last week, they started dubbing it. And oh, they yeah. Did one episode where it's just Steve Bloom and Steve Bloom. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Steve Bloom <laughs> doing Spike Spiegel and then Steve Bloom doing Lee Ron. That'd be great. <laughs> I'd watch it. Me too. That'd be awesome. Yeah. But I feel like there's All a right. lot I could, a lot of that we can talk about Pop Teen Epic, but we probably should move on tonight. Mm-hmm. Probably. All right. Let's just keep moving on. Um, some of these shows I haven't checked out yet. There's a new Fate series coming out that's also going to be on Netflix that Ryan talked about just a little bit before he ducked out. Um, so there's the... Um, I know that you're a fan of the original, Tobias, but there's the new installment in the Record of Lotus War, War like franchise. Yeah, it's Grand the Crest. Record of Grand Crest War. Do you know anything yeah. about that? Uh, not, I actually haven't started watching it yet. I, it has been on my list, but, you know, been busy with the convention, so I haven't really got to sit down and enjoy it. I mean, in general, the idea is really cool. It's just one long D&D campaign that they've had since before Lodos came out. So it's the same world in general. I'm sure there are some changes. Of course, I'm sure it's a whole new chapter of that entire saga. But, you know, as, as someone who's done a panel on, like, RPGs and, you know, tabletop RPGs in Japan and sort of follow this a little bit. It's really fascinating to see what they've done with this you know, D&D campaign they've been doing forever and writing, you know, novels and manga and anime about it. Hmm. That's pretty rad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I've never watched Lotus War. It was uh, something that definitely, you know, passed over me. But um, yeah, let me know what you think of the new one and how it connects to the old one, because I'm definitely interested to seeing seeing that because i know um i know bill has been expressing some uh some disconnect between like the original basilisk and the one that's coming out now um so it'd be interesting if there's like more of that for this or less Mm. of that if they're more well integrated um so yeah just just keep me keep me in the know friend cool yeah and i would say then you should go back and watch the original lodos ova they're really good and i feel like as someone who plays a lot of D, it can see a lot of those games get bogged down in really dumb jokes like Monty Python references. Mm-hmm. Lodos War keep things really pure. And like, like I wish all, any of my D&D games would be like Lodos War because they play it all straight. It's this epic tale. It's just really, really well done. And if they're anything like that, if they keep that storytelling, uh, you know, that, that clarity of purpose in Grand Cast, I'm sure it'll be a great watch. Cool, cool. All right, well, I guess we're moving on to, you know, my, my review series of this season which is laid back camp and um i have absolutely no joke enjoyed every moment of this show like i just put the uh fourth episode review up on the site and uh absolutely every episode has been a true little delight i really did not expect to enjoy this show so much because it's super simple i thought it was going to be sort of a just sort of pure cute girls doing cute things but there's camping involved but it it is that but it's also a lot more than that um it's a show that very much uses its real world locations to its advantage like they go to real campgrounds in real areas of real japan and um you can go online and sort of like look up places that these campgrounds are based off of and it it teaches you interesting things about camping and you know i'm i I used to camp a lot whenever I was younger and haven't really, you know, Andrew still does it. Um, but, um, I don't, I don't really do it so much, but it, it sort of, um, it rekindles my, uh, my campfire of being interested in the uh, idea of camping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> um, I don't, I mean, I don't think I will cause I, I like inside too much, but, um, Air conditioning. yeah, exactly. But this show is just so cozy. Like it, it has this great like feeling about it. It has a soundtrack that really pairs very well. Like I compared some of the tracks in the soundtrack to stuff that you would hear in like like Lord of the Rings, some of the more like sort of um low key tracks like uh concerning hobbits and songs like that that are more like, you know, light and fluffy and rustic and they have this sort of warm feeling about them. And that's basically this entire show and hmm. and it's also legitimately funny. Like there are so many gags in this show that are timed perfectly and the characters are really funny like hilariously written sometimes and there's just some extended gags that they really go for and it's not this sort of like manic screaming comedy that you see in a lot of other school dramas it's some really well thought out gags that i find a lot of pleasure in it's definitely it's definitely on the polar opposite spectrum of pop team epic 
yeah. um, in terms of its comedy because it's a it's a very slow building like simple comedy, but all of the gags so far have really paid off for me. So I really love Laid Back Camp. It's it's awesome. That is, I think, next on my list. I still haven't really watched any of it after you know seeing you gush about it day after day, but now it's definitely caught my eye too. Yeah, I mean, I I don't want to build it up too much because it is a really simple show. Like it it really doesn't do anything that hasn't been done before but i guess it just does it in such a such a pleasant way like it reminds like did you ever watch um uh girl uh kofuku graffiti a couple years ago no i don't think i did it was the shaft show about the the two girls that really like cooking and it was the one that like the the food gasm memes came out of that wasn't food wars If you remember that at all, but even if you don't, it's fine. All I remember is Food Wars. Yeah, yeah, I gotcha. It came out around the same time as Food Wars, so it kind of got buried because uh, Food Wars is definitely a more. I mean, it's it's a Shonen Jump thing, so it, it's it's going to be bigger, and it's more, um, I guess, more bombastic food. anyway. Yeah. But it has a similar feeling to that. Like it takes place during the winter time, and all the characters are all nice and bundled, so you get to see them like huddling around campfires, and it's just so so pleasant, just so pleasant. I love it. And um, that's pretty much all I have to say about that one. So I guess we can move on to the show that you're covering and that I have caught up with and that Andrew has seen one episode of, and that's A Place Further Than the Universe. Yes, this has been the big surprise of the season for me. Uh, you know, I started it just thinking, oh, this looks you know, interesting. Some, a couple of you were talking about it. I was looking for a safe choice, really, uh, you know, since I know I was going to be doing weekly reviews. So I just, I just went with this. It sounded interesting. But it has been a really worthwhile watch for sure. Uh, definitely surprised me. So, A Place for the Universe is uh, a Madhouse original. I think they're first since uh, Death Parade. Is that right, Austin? I believe so, yeah. And uh, it's uh, exactly like Death Parade. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, I think before then, the last one was Kaiba in 2008. So, Madhouse doesn't do a whole lot of original stuff. This is you know, one of those rare. Works, and I feel like they really, they really nailed it with this. Uh, in general, the show is about our main cast of characters, uh, headed by uh, Mari and uh, Shirase, who she meets in the first episode, and then joined by a couple other girls as they sort of plan to take a trip from Japan to Antarctica. With this idea, you know, each of the girl has their own reason for going, but like Mari, that is that she's just tired of like sitting in a rut and just sitting you know, at home and being that good school girl that just goes to school every day without going on any adventures. And, you know, we have Shirase with her, her, her mother had gone to Antarctica before and was lost. So she's got a personal reason for going. So it, it's, it's, it, but it's exploring these characters and, and their reasons for doing what they do. It's really big in exploring their friendships and how they develop. Uh, you know, they have these, these, these young girl friendships. Uh, I, Again, it's really easy to go into skeevy territory here, but they do not do so. And it is again another very another very wholesome show. Uh, it's just really innocent, really interesting to see how how they scheme to do this. I was afraid in the first episode that you know the, the whole MacGuffin was they had a bunch of money. Like sure, I'll say it had a whole envelope full of cash. Oh well, they're just going to buy passage to a boat, and that'll be the end of the series. But seeing them overcome these complications uh, time and time again, you know, to sort of achieve these goals, you know, meet more friends along the way, including uh, best girl Hinata, uh, for <laughs> sure. Uh, and just the thing how they how goofy they can be because they all have they're all have their own very you know distinct characters. Shirase is the more serious one that's ready to give up at a moment's notice because everything is you know insurmountable. You know, we have Mari, that bubbly foil to that, and even Hinata, who's kind of like this mix of both uh, Mari's you know, bubbliness and also this crushing reality of you know, adulthood. She's ready to toss that in any moment. Uh, all, all of Hinata's shirts are great, too. If you just kind of watch, he just has an yes. amazing selection of t-shirts. Like the whole, <laughs> whole, whole like, fried shrimp tempura, just the one episode. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I haven't, unfortunately, caught up with this. Like, we had to watch episode three to finish off my review series and not watch, watch four. But I, I st- will definitely be keeping up with this because it's just a whole lot of fun to watch week to week. It is. It's it's kind of like the cast from K-On like tries to go on a cruise and like <laughs> fails at every step of the way. But you know that they're trying their best. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of what it feels like. And it's it's really fun. Like you're absolutely right. It's 
it's super sweet. It's super pure. There's no like skeeviness involved. And just to go back to laid back camp for a second, it, there's also no skeeviness involved in there too. So it seems like this is a really good season for some pure comedy, which is hilarious because we've got pop team Epic here too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot, um, of, a lot of good stuff for like genuine, like female relationships, like female friendship. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And, um, yeah. Is there, really, um, is there really any greater female relationship than Popco and Pipimi from uh, Pop Team Epic? I mean, how much I, do you love me? <laughs> a whole lot. A whole lot. Oh, <laughs> I love that. Are you are you upset? Are, no. <laughs> are you upset? No. <laughs> no. That. No. No. <laughs> that, that 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 is Tori and Austin. Yeah, it is. I, it really is. I believe yeah. it. Tori and I have been making that joke for weeks since we saw that episode. <laughs> but um the video. Yeah. <laughs> but um yeah, Place Further is uh super sweet. It's it's good and it's it's got some pretty good animation too and the, oh, the character yeah. designs are neat. Yeah, for sure. And there's a lot of uh like, you know, I I mentioned this in the very first review I did that I feel like a lot of anime nowadays is taking direct inspiration from real life areas where you mm. got people comparing real life areas in Japan with things in anime. And I feel like that sort of same thing we see here. Like I haven't gone frame by frame to compare to real life locations, but something about the amount of detail they have in a lot of the background scenes really like triggers that in me. This awesome, this well done background animation design. This is all part of a larger scheme to get people to move back to the Japanese countryside. Yeah. Yeah, because we see that in, we saw that in Barakamon. I talked a little bit about that in my review, and I love that show. And there's definitely all that feeling in in Layback Camp too, just like being like, "Oh, look at all of these cool places that are not big cities that you should totally go live and have fun in." Wink, wink. <laughs> and yet, your name uh, influenced everybody to move into the city <laughs> because of reasons that I won't get into because spoilers. Oh, yeah, because if you go live in the country, you might, something, yeah. Something might happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can spoil that movie in, in in another, I don't know, 20 days. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, um, I guess uh, really quick, I want to talk about the new Card Captor Soccer that came out because um, I haven't. I'm, I haven't seen all of Card Capture Soccer, but I've seen a good chunk of it, and I decided to just check out the first episode of this new season to sort of see what's see what's going on, um, at least on a superficial level, because I am by no means like a, a Sakura like super fan or anything, and I've only really started watching it maybe in the past year or so, and it's it's just something that I, I find really enjoyable and cute. So I wanted to talk about that uh, that first episode for a little bit. Um, it seems to pick up like pretty much basically like a, a little bit after the events of the original series. Like Sakura is in middle school now, so she's a little bit more grown up and has apparently not been a magical girl for like some period of time now and sort of like, you know, hung up her her outfit and hung up her her wand and all that stuff. But the um uh Kerberos, I think is his name, is still around and um they continue to have antics and it seems like there's some new card related issue that's going on. So I'm sure she'll have to, you know, break out her magical girl powers and take care of that again. But you know, the whole, the whole cast is back, the whole crew and, um, uh, Kerberos does a really neat little, um, I apologize if I'm pronouncing his name wrong. I'm not reading it right now. I'm just trying to recall it from memory. Um, but he does a really cute, quick, like, complete series recap in like the first 10 seconds of the first episode he's just like these are all the things that happen and he tells it really really quickly and it's like okay it's now time for the episode and i thought oh that was really funny because like it it has been a significantly long time since there was any new like card captor stuff and i think they did that really quickly to sort of like acknowledge that yes this is a sequel but yeah you don't really need to have seen the rest of it at least it doesn't feel like it because it sort of just throws you in and you sort of get reintroduced to all these characters. And I don't really feel like you needed to know who they are. You just sort of have to have a general grasp of what's going on. I'm sure it'll get more like plot heavy later on. Um, probably call back things from the original series. But um, the animation style is beautiful. It's again another Madhouse show. And it's slated for uh, for 22 episodes. 
And um, it looks really, really pretty. I mean, the original series looked good too, but it was definitely like, you know, that classic, like late 90s uh, cell animation that, that still really holds up. But this new series just looks looks absolutely stunning for, for what it is. It's got some great like digital effects compositing and the lighting is really cool and it and it still looks like the original show like it just looks like a very modernized version Hmm. um whereas something like sailor moon crystal is like kind of a really big departure from what the original anime looked like because they were going for a um an art style that was more similar to the manga but this uh, card captors really really feels like just a like a betterized version sort of like watching a new dragon ball it's kind of the same idea right so um, I can't really speak much to it other than that because I've only really seen a, a bit of it. But um, I'm definitely excited to, um, well, first finish off the original original series and then and then check this one out because it looks looks really fun. All right, so I guess next will be you, Andrew, because you've got two shows to talk about, and they're actually right next to each other. Yeah, they are directly next to each other. Uh, so first, uh, I want to talk about Mitsuboshi Colors. Uh, it's essentially, I heard it described best, and I can't f- really find a better way to describe it, is, uh, is three Yotsubas terrorizing a local police officer. Um, and <laughs> Somebody uh, on Twitter said that. I'd have to no, credit it them. Was, it was, uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, what's his name from Anime News Network? I credited him in my article, so if you want to know who said that, it's in my Mitsuboshi Colors article. You have to go to the, the webpage. Uh, episode, Check it out. episode one review, yeah. Um, and it's, if, I mean, and it's just that. Um, it's not necessarily three Yotsubas because uh, everyone here knows how much I love Yotsuba. Um, I'll just, you know, for everybody listening, I'll just say I love Yotsuba a whole lot. Uh, I haven't like gathered. Oh, really? Okay. But it's just, it doesn't necessarily do anything special. It's just three small girls who, like, form this quote-unquote like detective agency to sort of like defend defend their local park from dangers or whatever i will tell you that in the second episode they do save the universe and the entire planet wow um which is very impressive uh but once again i have to come back and reel it in a little bit because i mean this show even though uh it certainly can play and be and play on my heartstrings and be cute a lot of the time and be charming, but it's it's extremely average because it's comedy style. It doesn't. It's not really. It's not really something that would sort of match with this. Um, a lot of th- a lot of the things that the children do aren't like solving mysteries which was where I think the show could really shine was if it would actually they would actually go out and then, like, separate uh, segments of the episode to where they solve different mysteries and solve problems for people and where they actually act like a, de- like a detective agency and, like, a protection organization, even though they're three elementary school age children. So is it the same kind of disconnect with people watching K-On! for the first time and being like, why aren't they practicing music? They're just drinking tea. Sort of. But, like, it's not as extreme as that. Okay. Um, like, you can tell that they're trying to sort of have that happen, sort of have them go around and solve puzzles, but they're not necessarily, like, interesting puzzles. I can give you an example. Um, in the second episode, they're wandering through... They're wandering through, like, a shopping district... And they walk past an alleyway and they see a, uh, like a sign that says no access closed or whatever. Um, and so they're immediately like, oh, it must be drugs. Uh, <laughs> we gotta, we gotta go check this out. And so they start walking down the alleyway and they're like, there's nothing here. What do we do? And then somebody comes up and is like, hey, you're not supposed to be back there. And of course they take off running uh, because they think he's a drug dealer. And so they start running around, whatever. They get out on the other side of the alley. And then they're like, there's nothing in there. Why was it closed? And so they keep walking and they find another one. And that whole th- series repeats. And they find another one. And that whole series of events repeats. And then the, and then they, like, they go, um, sorry. Let's just have a pause here. 
You're good. And then for the third time, the guy asked him, was like, why do you keep running away? Um, and, uh, dang it. All right. Let me start over again. And then for the last time, after they don't find anything again, uh, they sort of realize the guy tells them, like, we just painted the ground in here. And then he cuts away to, like, the ground. And they had tracked, what, white paint all over the ground mm -hmm. for, like, miles and miles where they had ran. So, and, so I'll go back and say some of it is charming, definitely. There's definitely something there. Um, but... Once again, it's something that I'm going to have to keep watching and hope that it gets better. Um, it doesn't really capture your attention in a way that Nietzsche Joe does, where it's very outlandish and ridiculous, and that's how it keeps your attention. It's trying to keep your attention through more conventional means, I guess. Right. I guess it, by what you're describing, it sounds like it's kind of trying to capitalize on like the... Uh the naivety of, of children and how that can be funny. Yeah. And it's, um, it's not as funny as it, uh, it's played out to be. It's like, well, it's not as funny as they think it is. Um, because I think one of the greatest things about the show is that is their relationship with the local police officer and how he thinks they're brats and wants them out of his face. Um, but like, if they just, if if this show was just about like the colors trying to take down this police officer, then it would be much more funny because one of the greatest screenshots of the season, I think, is going to be the three colors pointing an RPG at at um at the police officer. Mm -hmm. I think that 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 will last a while because who doesn't like kids and explosive devices? So is it like absurdist, or is it played like sort no. of straight? It's played straight. Um, that's interesting. It's played straight, which I think hurts this show. Okay. Um, if it was, you know, outlandish and ridiculous, I think it would uh, sort of come across better. Okay. Cool. Well, do you want to move on to talking about Miss Koizumi? Oh, jeez. I'll move right into talking about Miss Koizumi. For a show that has the most bawling opening I have seen in a long time and is so dang pretty at every turn and makes the food look so good boy is this show boring mm. i mean i and here's the problem this is the thing that gets me confused about this one i see something there like i still want to keep watching it just hoping just hoping that i can find something here and you know i keep watching it and i keep going and i'm like I'm waiting for it. I'm where where's it at? Where's the where's the really cool, you know, whatever. And then it's just like, oh, Miss Koizumi is just a ramen otaku who cares nothing else about life except ramen, even to the point where she wears her school uniforms on the weekends and just goes to ramen shops and plans her entire schedule around whatever ramen she wants that day. That's a lot of carbs. Yeah. Yeah. And and then, like, our main girl is, like, the only reason that she's sort of interested in, you know, ramen shops and eating ramen is because she wants to have a relationship with Koizumi, who is, uh, who is the ramen otaku. Um, and then the other two girls, one's just the generic student, student council president who has it all together, and the other one is the Sunday Ray that's really popular with everybody. Um, so it's very tropey <sighs> and th it, this show confuses me more than any, anything else is what I have to say, because I, I do see something here. Um, I, I'm just, I'm just, I just keep waiting for it to show through. I'll keep watching it just cause it's so pretty and, uh, it has a great, uh, little, um, separator like it's paced out great that's one of the best things about the show the best things about the show are the animation super pretty um how the food looks the opening and ending tracks are really good um and it's paced out sort of in like quadrants sort of how uh 
sort of how Azamanga Dio is paced. Um, because not everything is, you know, sort of together. Everything's sort of disconnected. Um, which is great, you know, because it's a it's a series based on a four coma, and that really helps when uh, you you have a show that's paced like that. If you actually follow how it how it was written in the manga, hmm. right? But well, I'm sorry you're stuck with uh, two shows that you're not really digging. So well, no, it's fine. Uh, I think colors will get better. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's a lot there that. There's a lot more in colors to where it can uh to where it can be better. I can talk briefly about Takanomi. Okay. Well, I guess we can just talk about that one and then probably wrap it up because I don't really think that there's anything else other than what we anything else to talk about sure. other than mm-hmm. that one. So mm-hmm. you want to tackle Takunomi? Tackle Takanomi? Yeah, sure. Um, Takunomi it literally means drinking at home. I think. Uh, somebody look that up for me. I'm pretty sure that's what it means. I trust you. Um, and it's, and it's fine. I think it's good. Uh, it's, it's not a full length episode. I think each episode's 13 minutes. Um, and it follows sort of a, a country girl who's come to Tokyo to change a career or to due to a career change. And this is another working woman's, uh, anime, which is very popular these days. Can I say, um, and it's just a show about, Four ladies that live in the same house because they each, you know, work and can't afford a can't afford a house by themselves, and then they just sit at home and and drink pretty much. This sounds like new game without the game. It's new game without the game and with uh, more alcohol than there was a new game. Oh, okay. Um, but you know, it's it's really good. Um, it's really sweet. Um, it. I can't really go into much more about it since it's a since it's a short, but um, I'm excited to see where it goes. I may pick it up and do some writing for it uh, when I'm finished with when I'm finished with uh, colors and uh, Koizumi. But you know, I think I like it. I think it's fine. I think it's definitely a bright point cool. of the season. Cool. All right. So I guess in wrapping up, Tobias, I have a question. Yeah. So. If you had to pick one thing that someone should watch from this season, what do you think? What would you pick? I mean, I honestly don't think you should get out without watching at least one episode of Pop Team Epic. But I think the safer choice is a place further than the universe. I think everyone could really get behind and enjoy that. You know, I'd probably agree with you. Mm hmm. I think that it remains to be seen for Darling and the Franks um, yeah. because I could I could see how that would be alienating to certain people and not everybody would enjoy it. I still think it could go either way. Even, even if it like doesn't get skeevy at all, I don't yeah. think it would. I think there's a lot of people that just aren't into Gynax style stuff that are, yeah. you know, a objectively wrong, but. <laughs> also just you know it's just not there it's not their bag and that that's cool like even even then if that's not you're not really into that kind of style of stuff i understand that but i think like uh you know place for the universe is safe choice i think everyone is surely at least check it out give it a couple episodes there i'm sure by this point the you know the internet media machine has already shown you some of pop team epic so you've already kind of made your mind up on that one way or another but uh place further i haven't seen quite as much universal uh, you know, exposure to, and I, I think mm-hmm. that's a worthwhile show that every anime fan should at least check out. For sure. And I think, you know, I, I would agree with you in that. Uh, like I said, sort of barring, um, you know, Violet Evergarden and seeing how that plays out. Um, um, the fact that Netflix grabbed that one sort of tells me that it has the potential to be like a very sort of general crowd pleaser. Right. I know um, Netflix doesn't always they they do sort of get some niche genre stuff too, um, but a lot of what they have on there, especially their um, uh, like Netflix exclusives, they try and go for the a very broad audience, um, with the exception of uh, Knights of Cydonia, because I mean not a lot of people are into the space made bear in uh, <laughs> that has a a robot claw. <laughs> Was I the only person on Earth that watched that show? Yeah. I, I think I so. didn't watch it. Yeah, it is it not that good. But anyway, um, 
So yeah, um, if anybody's looking for one thing to check out, probably the safest bet would be a place further than the universe. It's it's pretty it's pretty good. What do you have to say, Andrew? I got one more thing to talk about that I forgot to talk about. Okay. Um, so just out of nowhere, like last week, uh, Crunchyroll tweeted out. Oh right. Uh, that they had a surprise for everybody, and they tweeted out a picture of Toru from Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid. And I just immediately got very excited because I'm a huge fan of that show. And it turns out that they were releasing, they tweeted out that they were going to release the Valentine's Day OVA for Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid uh, in like an hour after they tweeted it. And luckily, when I saw the tweet, they had tweeted, tweeted it like 30 minutes before I saw it. So I was very excited. But the downside was I had to wait 30 minutes for episode 14 of uh, Kobayashi Dragon Maid, and I got to see it, and it is very good. Um, it's very much a you know a Valentine's Day episode. Uh, they went to a hot spring, which was very nice. Um, it still retained that key. I haven't really talked about Kobayashi a lot. It's something I do I do want to talk about. There's something in the in the works for Kobayashi for me that. Everybody awesome. will see soon, um, but it's a it's a really good just one off uh, sweet thing. It's only subbed right now. It's not it's not dubbed yet. I do hope it gets a dub because the dub cast for Kobayashi is extremely good. Um, and it was just something excited that I that I that I like to see uh, come out. Uh, and getting to see more of that show is always nice because it was originally. You know, just 13 episodes, just sort of a one-off, and uh, it came out in 2015. I think. No, um, 2017. Yeah, 2017. Yeah, oh, it was early. Yeah, it was early this year. Um, or last, last year, year. Sorry, it was early last year. Um, and it was on my top 10 list. Yeah, that's true. Um, and it was good. So it was good to see more of that. Um, I hope we get more of Kobayashi because it's a really wholesome show that I think definitely has mainstream appeal. Mm-hmm. Um. There's more of the manga, so the material's there. The material's there. Um, it's something that can sell if yeah. it's marketed right. Yeah. Kana likes to eat stuff. Cool. Yeah. Um, it's true. But it's something that I thought would be good to mention for all the all the peeps out there. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Thanks mm-hmm. for checking that out and talking about it. Mm-hmm. We got anything else we want to chat about before we wrap this guy up? Uh, I think we are pretty good there. The only other... You know, 2018 fresh thing that everyone's talking about right now is uh, still Devil Man. But I think That's we're going to do a podcast just on Devil Man. That'll be probably the next one, I think, right? The next star, the next. Yeah, it'll probably be the one after you guys do your do your conversations episode. We'll be we'll be tackling Devil Man. Well, finally, I practice our Devil Man runs. Yep, yep. Got to make sure to have that Hanna Barbera soundtrack going while we do it, though. <laughs> All right, well, Tobias, thank you for joining us on this, uh, again, highly successful, excellent five-star episode of the Third Impact Anime Podcast. Mm-hmm. Sure as always. All right, Andrew, thanks for, thanks for coming by and, and joining this, even though you're, you're right beside me in the, in the flesh. Yeah, uh-huh. I'm awfully close to you. Yeah, indeed. Awfully too close. Yeah, indeed. And closer. No, no, no. No! no. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, um, I guess that has been our episode. Uh, Tobias, where can people find you on social media? So I'm available on Twitter primarily uh, at Reverend underscore Tobias. You can find me uh, as that on Facebook as well. I primarily uh, use that as my convention appearance page. But uh, you can also catch me hanging out at Third Impact information, which I'm sure Austin will give you right now. I will. Andrew, where can people find you on social media for sports ball and anime thoughts? Yeah, mostly sports ball. Um, you can find me at toaster underscore Mike on Twitter. Uh, sometimes I tweet about anime. Most of the time it's just retweets of sports ball. Sully mentioned to me today that as soon as he followed me on Twitter, like immediately like 10 sports Twitters were recommended to him and he blamed me for it so i'm sorry so <laughs> well, you are at fault for that i know so. i'm sorry <laughs> it's all right and again i'm austin i'm the host of this thing occasionally most of the time and uh you can find me on twitter at bebop shock and that's bebop as in cowboy bebop and that's shock as in bioshock 
So you can find me over there, mostly talking about anime. It's a sports ball free zone, except maybe I'll post a picture of Andrew bowling maybe once a year because he likes to bowl. That's a thing I do. Yep. Yeah. You like to take pictures of him bowling? Apparently. Uh, well, I mean, I, I like to bowl, and th- there's this one picture that I have of him that I put the space filter on, oh, and it's, very good. it's like a very <laughs> aesthetic. Like I'm sort of leaning to the right, so it's like space field, bowling alley, and then me sort of like leaning, and it's a good one. That'll, yeah. that'll go up. On my my Twitter now in 20 minutes. Sure, maybe, but I don't know if I want to find it. But anyway, thank you guys so much for coming by and listening to the Third Impact Anime Podcast. We really appreciate it. And um, uh, you can find this podcast pretty much anywhere. You can find it on iTunes and on Google Play and on Stitcher Radio and on Podbean, which is our main host. And you can find out a lot more information about Third Impact stuff on our website, which is, again, Third Impact anime.wordpress.com and then our Facebook page is facebook.com slash third impact anime so thank you guys again for mm-hmm. for joining me for this podcast and um, I guess we'll see you in the next one